I am in the grocery store looking at the plentiful piles of fruits and vegetables from all over the world, appreciating the rainbow of colors calling to me. I feel grateful for our abundance. And I wonder if they eat so well where this food was grown. And I wonder as the world warms, if food will always be so abundant. I walk in my neighborhood, chatting with people out working in their yards, enjoying the abundance of trees and berries and flowers. And I feel grateful for the peace that we share. And I wonder what it would take to build a stronger sense of community than we even have now. I go to a peace rally with people who hope we will trade fighter jets and tanks for social well being and greater equality. And I feel grateful for my right to peaceful gathering and the opportunity not to live every minute in fear. And I remember the threat of nuclear war in my childhood. And I watch Ukrainians crawl into bomb shelters. I read an eco-social manifesto from the people of the South. It calls us to reject false solutions and insincere promises. It calls for a world of inclusion, collaboration, and relations of equality. It imagines a world where the forest and all its inhabitants are our brothers and sisters. And I feel grateful for the dreamers who point the way. I consider the current escalation of war and violence all around us, putting us all at risk of mortal conflict. And I wonder what the people who are promoting war and violence are dreaming about. Today, we can finally see enough to realize that we truly live in a time of major world transition, something the level of the industrial revolution or the agricultural revolution. This is the time we share. The dance of Shiva is going at full tilt and the stakes are very high. In the news, we hear constantly of the threats, the storms, the fires, the floods, the heat domes caused by climate change. Threats of World War III as world tensions rise. Conflict and crisis drive the news. We don't hear so often about all the millions of people who are working to find solutions, writing books, doing research, engineers, entrepreneurs, artists, philosophers, journalists, business people, all over the world working for solutions. Could all the violence, fear, and chaos around us be a necessary part of the cycle of life? Do the structures and systems of corruption have to be broken to make room for a new foundation for living in relationship with the earth? Today, we will explore what it takes to ride the wave of destruction and creation with hope and courage, love and gratitude. Flame of fire, spark of the universe, that warmed our ancestral hearth, agent of life and death, give us deep gratitude for the earth, the natural world, for our brothers and sisters, the microbes, creepy crawlies, trees and plants, winged ones, swimmers, four and two-legged, the interdependent web of all existence, moving and changing, ebbing and flowing in the dance of life.
So please join me in singing. Um, this is There's a River Flowing in My Soul from our Blue Songbook, number 1007. Thank you to the slide sharers for sharing the lyrics. And um, please rise as you're willing and able after I play the melody all the way through. Our story today, if I could have slide one, please, Jane, is in honor of International Women's Day. I decided to choose my favorite image, the series of statues honoring the famous five that lives on Parliament Hill. These were ordinary women who believed in themselves, saw what was needed, and wouldn't stop till things changed. This ginger group of Alberta women pressed the federal government to refer the person's case to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled against them, finding that women were not persons. Therefore, they appealed to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in Britain and on October 18, 1929, the decision was overruled and held that women were qualified persons eligible to be appointed to the Senate. Unfortunately, yes. Oh, I'm, I'm not close enough to the mic. Thank you, Tony, for helping me with that. Uh, okay, so who were these women? Uh, next slide. Emily Murphy, suffragette, reformer, writer, first judge in the British Empire. And when she was a judge, she was often in family law and saw how badly the women were treated uh, when they got divorced. They didn't have anything. They were destitute. So she fought for the Married Women's Protective Act, which passed in Alberta in 1911. Nellie McClung, slide three. Novelist, reformer, journalist, suffragette, won the vote for the Manitobans in 1916. Saskatchewan and Alberta soon followed and then became an MLA for Alberta. And in her, at the end of her career, she sat on the Board of Governors for the CBC, working for women journalists. She didn't think they had to be assistants anymore. 
Slide four. I call this the tea clatch. Beware of those women getting together over tea. You never know what may come out of it. <laughs> Slide five. Henrietta Muir Edwards. A woman after my own heart, no slave to fashions, artist, legal expert, especially for the needs of women and children. And she helped to form the National Council for Women of Women for Canada. Slide six. Yes. The proclamation, Nellie McClung and Irene Palby. You can just see the energy radiating out of them. Uh, they, they, they picked each other up. It was because they were together, these exciting women. Next, Irene Palby. This British aristocrat came to Alberta to be an Alberta farm wife. Reminds me of my grandmother who went home with her new husband to find a leaky log cabin and almost no furniture. It was up to her to make it a livable place. Irene advocated for rural women and children, elected to the Alberta legislator in 1921 against her better instincts, by the way. She used her platform to get traveling medical clinics and distance education. Nine, slide nine. Ah, the next one. I didn't do. Did I miss one? Did I miss Louise? Okay, here's Louise. Suffragette Women's Christian Temperance Union. First member of Legislative Assembly in the British Empire. Elected as, in Alberta as an independent. I guess none of the parties would have her. Responsible for the first Dower Act, so that a man could not sell her home out from under her without her knowledge and consent. The next one, that was the proclamation. So that's where I've got. Okay, and here we have uh, today, they are continuing to inspire the next generations. So everybody who goes up there on Parliament Hill, go and see that statue. It's just. It's just a marvelous statue. And our last slide, read it with me. This is the message. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you. The, the Dance of Shiva, written by Francis Deverell. Like the dance of Shiva, the universe breathes, creating, sustaining, destroying in a symphonic rhythm. Microbes and bacteria, the creepy crawlies, the plants, the four-leggeds, the two-leggeds, the winged ones and the finned ones, in air, water, and on land the stars, planets, and galaxies, everyone, everywhere, all levels of existence engaged in the heartbeat of life. Birth, growth, death, and rebirth. In every moment, something is forming, something is growing and changing, and something is falling apart, disintegrating, dissolving, dying. The source of all movement, Shiva's dance, gives rhythm to the universe, 
He dances in evil places, in sacred. He creates and preserves, destroys and releases. We are part of this dance, this eternal rhythm. And woe to us if blinded by illusions, we detach ourselves from the dancing cosmos, this universal harmony. Ruth Peel. I will introduce the meditation. We will have a quiet minute of reflection. And afterwards, Patrick will lead us out of meditation, first by playing and then singing our song, Be Ye Lamps Unto Yourselves. And thank you, Jane, for sharing the words when the time comes. And please join us in the last rounds of the chant if you feel comfortable and you've heard, you feel you feel you know the tune thank you why does hinduism have a god dancing of creation and destruction as its core this is the question that came to me when i found myself staring at this gorgeous bronze statue at a child haven dinner and auction the dance of destruction i thought why i was about i was just completely drawn into the image into the incredible energy of it what is it about you can look at this copy of an ancient indian artifact it is probably the iconic interpretation of the Hindu metaphor of the dance of Shiva developed by 9th and 10th century artists in India. By the 12th century, it was seen as the supreme statement of Hindu art. If you are close enough, you may enjoy the tactile exploration. If you are online or further away in the hall, I, I, was, I was going to bring my my bronze thing but i i neglected to do so so this is not an option what i was about to say in any case relax open yourself allow the energy of it to hit you engage you experience it what does it say to you that's my invitation for your silent time Be mm -hmm. 
As we sing that song, I'm reminded of the story that Diane told of the whirling dervishes uh, uh, the, uh, f from a few weeks ago and how they had their center so that they were whirling around their center and they never lost their place. The image of Shiva's dance embodies the rhythm and harmony of life. Nataraj, the dancing Shiva, is shown with four hands, representing the four directions, the earth, the air, the fire, and the water, the four seasons, childhood, the energy and promise of youth, the power and maturity in midlife, and the elder and the crone. He is dancing with his left foot elegantly raised and right foot on a prostate figure, sometimes seen as a baby. Apasmara Purusha. Some say Shiva is standing triumphant over the personification of illusion and ignorance. Imagine that being at our foundation. Others say the baby is new and fresh and the energy of creativity and new possibilities. Feel the joy, the life and vitality as the dancer spins inside a circle of fire. The symbol sits on the very foundation, the lotus pedestal. It is at our core, the lotus flower as the symbol of all the creative forces of the universe. Thank you. It makes me reflect on our foundation, our own personal foundation, the foundations of our faith community as Unitarian Universalists, and the foundational beliefs and institutions of our society, because we seem to be in such a mess I have been thinking a lot about what is at our core in human societies. What are the assumptions at the core of our philosophical, theological, economic, scientific, and governance systems? What kind of a society do we have when the core institutions are so totally out of balance? When the economic system is founded on the vice of greed, instead of service to the common good. A system which allows 0.01% of the population to control 90% of the world's wealth and how that wealth will be used. When our governments give away our power to the lords of industry and the fox is in charge of the chicken coop. What kind of society would allow the tech giants to create any kind of artificial intelligence without oversight, without any consideration or reflection on the consequences? For that matter, not just artificial intelligence, the freedom to invent and build any invention they can think of and deploy it if they think they can make money. I obviously have Elon Musk in mind. What kind of review happened to determine if driverless vehicles would make a better society? I don't remember any. 
I certainly didn't get a chance to participate in it. Our social media giants have known design knowingly designed algorithms to disrupt our intention spans, sow misinformation, amplify anger and hatred, and suppress our ability to think and create. When I'm on Facebook, I never pick angry or sad or any of those. I don't want to reinforce their desire to manipulate me with those emotions. Okay, hang on. So suppress our ability to think, create, collaborate, and solve the world's problems. Maybe we are actually not getting anywhere because of some of these foundational problems. What kind of leaders would play chicken in an arms race and put the world at risk of nuclear war? Whatever happened to the search for truth, honor, and the sacredness of your word. The image? Yes, there he is. Shiva's upper left hand holds a flame. Is it our chalice? The call to truth, to love, and to gratitude? Be ye lamps unto yourselves. Be your own confidence. The lower right shows the gesture of assertion. It's the gesture I use when I'm encouraging people, if your boundary has been crossed, do this and they will know immediately there's something wrong. Confront the harm. Stop doing what is killing us. We must face the truth and root it out. We need to break apart the systems that aren't working. Replace these foundations of greed and ignorance. And if we don't do it, maybe nature is going to do it for us. We need to make room for the new creative energies that are coming, that are chomping at the bit waiting to burst forth in a new world, a green transition where we are all one, where every voice is heard and everyone has access to the basic needs of life. The snakes in the image that are wound around his arm and through his hair stand for egotism and are seen uncoiling as he dances. The ego is the constant presence that makes it unclear whether the battle to satisfy one's own desires ahead of everyone else will drives the will to uh, uh, will win the day or whether true democracy will prevail. The ego drives the will to power for power's sake. The famous five sitting in their knitting group having tea and discussing challenges provide another model. Will the people develop the ability to work together, to share, and to direct the energies of wealth for the well-being of all our brothers and sisters? Our brothers and sisters on the streets in the south, all the people who are in migration because they're homeless, and also all the animals, the salmon, the owls, the caribou, the whales, the forests and rivers and oceans. Can we put our egos in perspective in relation to the natural world and leave some room for it to thrive too? Or do we have to take it all, destroy its vitality and ability to generate life and a great diversity and abundance? His matted locks are whirling as he dances within an arch of flames, representing the endless cycle of birth and death. His third eye is symbolic of his omniscience, insight, and enlightenment. In that respect, he kind of re re uh, reminds me of Yahweh. Hinduwebsite.com suggests that, and I quote, Shiva's duty is to destroy all the worlds at the end of creation. 
and dissolve them into nothingness. In science, we call it entropy. Everything that exists is gradually losing its energy and will dissolve into nothingness. Perhaps Shiva is a huge expanding black hole that will eventually swallow everything. But in the meantime, he keeps himself occupied. Before the worlds really come to an end, Shiva has many things to do to keep them going. His first and foremost task is to destroy many things in order to ensure and protect the Ra, or the order of the universe, the innate moral law by which we live, and by which I don't feel like we are living very well today. Shiva's destruction is not negative. It's a positive, nourishing, constructive destruction that builds and transforms life and energy for the welfare of the world and the beings that inhabit it. He destroys in order to renew and regenerate life forms and facilitate the transformation, the evolution, or the modifications of nature. His destruction is the destruction of an artist, a surgeon, or a cook. Through destruction, he facilitates the smooth transition of things and events from one stage to another. As the dance of destruction unfolds, the door opens for rebirth, the dance of creation. We are living through one of these great times of transformation of culture and society the perhaps the greatest humanity has ever faced. Every system is under stress. The consequences of all our choices are arriving fast. We see destruction caused by wild weather or war everywhere and millions homeless. So once we get past our first reaction of despair, we ask ourselves, what can be done? What can I do? It's so beyond me. And the chatter begins. And all around the world, many people, great thinkers, are giving us their best ideas and going to work. First Nations have really grabbed the stage this last few years. And they're telling us that if we put our relationships at the center of all our decisions, our relationships with, with each other, yes, but even more importantly with the earth, then we will make better decisions more often than if we continue to operate on principles of individual freedom and greed. Business is telling us that they're already doing their best and they can't stop using fossil fuels likely for centuries. Big oil refuses to invest in a renewable future. There will always be resistors. Scientists are pretty solid on the nature of the problems, but are divided on solutions. Some would say, if we leave nature alone, she will heal herself. And those people are directing their effort to stop the destruction, to reclaim endangered ecosystems. We see these wonderful programs on television often of the people who are doing that. Entrepreneurs are working feverishly to build better solar systems, better batteries, better systems of mining, better food distribution and packaging, technical solutions, which we have the, the answers to. We just have to get to them. Some would say that we got ourselves into this mess using technology and we can use technology to get us out. They want more nuclear power, carbon capture and storage, geoengineering, where they block out the sun with a layer of dust. Some seek solutions through artificial intelligence. Vandana Shiva is of the opinion that the world is a mess because of the engineering mentality, mastery, conquest, ownership, silo thinking. She says no solution will be engineered. We have to look at the whole picture. Meanwhile, 
The people themselves know that we must act and that everyone must be part of the solution. As long as we are conflicted in a constant tug of war on every decision, we will not succeed. So we are building community. We are joining groups to solve particular bits of the problem. We know we need the full diversity of opinion. We need everyone's talents and skills. We must build our capacity for creative collaboration. We must engage all that we can and take care of anyone who's falling behind. The image of people just aligning themselves towards a common something and just being with each other and working together. The great creativity is also in motion. Artists, musicians, and storytellers are lifting our spirits with their love and compassion, confronting us with our brokenness and holding up their visions for the future. What do we do with the doctrine of discovery? You know, that one where you just have to plant a flag and you can say the land is yours now? Do we give the land back? Has capitalism outlived its usefulness? Or can we reclaim it and hold it accountable? Do we require a centralized strongman government, as some people believe? Or are we ready to do the hard work of working well with others? Democracy, messy as it is. I hear over and over again that we have ideas and the tools, we have everything we need to confront the climate crisis and reduce our emissions. But we don't have the political will we don't know how to build a national consensus, let alone a world one. How will we uproot the greed and corruption in our society all over the world so that we can begin again and sow new seeds of justice, equity, and compassion? The Unitarian circles we aspire, in, in our circles, we aspire to world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, we would be one people living on one planet. We are not there yet. But when you watch the millions of people walking in the streets in Iran, all those young women fighting for their rights in Russia, in Brazil, risking their lives for something they cannot see, healthcare workers going on strike in England and Canada, many other working groups too, transit recently, the people doing street theater to be the voice of the old growth forest and the spirit is stirring us everywhere. Remember the starlings? Can we imagine holding a common vision that would hold us together in that level of collaboration to bring new forms, new ways that will bring us closer to our dream? A relationship of respect and reverence for the natural world an attitude of gratitude and abundance that doesn't require us to hoard wealth and grab power, a green new deal that shares the wealth and leaves no one behind. 
Jeremy Lent suggests that life with will and agency is infused at every level of life, right down to a bacteria or a cell, including our own bodies. Our bodies are galaxies of entities working together, just like those starlings. They know how to do it already. We are part of nature. It's in our DNA. The people of the world are hungry for change. To satisfy that hunger, we must connect with the knowledge that is already in our DNA. Our reorientation to our bodies and to our relationships will guide us. We want voice. We want a seat at the table. We want real collaboration. This is not something we demand. It is something that we do in small groups with people who share our passions and our direction. Vandiva, Vandana Shiva says, a gift back to the earth in gratitude will, collect, will create the solutions. So may it be, all our relations. And uh, please join us in our closing song Number 1026, if every woman in the world. I'll play the melody all the way through, and then please rise as you're willing and able. <laughs> Greening Tree Project is your opportunity to tell us your stories about what you have done that might be called climate action. Anything counts, as long as, as it is recent. The stories can be about a minute long, and we can do a couple of people a week, and you're encouraged to do more than one story over the course of the year. Does anyone wish to tell their story today? We'll begin with those of you in the hall 
and then we'll invite those attending on Zoom. <clears throat> Um, I read an interesting article on the weekend that um, uh, an organization in, in Europe had come out with uh, a list of what is considered a sustainable uh, number of items of clothing, excluding, thankfully, shoes and, and <laughs> underwear, <laughs> or otherwise I'd be hooped. Um, <laughs> but it was 85. So being the kind of OCD person I am, I immediately went to my closets and started counting and found I had 91. And so I immediately went through and thought, okay, I'm getting, I haven't worn this in like two years. I haven't worn this in three years. I haven't worn that. Off it goes into the bag. And I'm not quite at 85, but I'm pretty close. So I'm feeling very virtuous. <laughs> Thank you. For those on Zoom, if you raise your electronic hand. Okay. Hi, I'm Jane. Um, I live in Ladysmith, and Ladysmith is really good. The town is really good at getting chunks of money to do things. And they got some money around uh, alleviating poverty. And they've had, I've been to two of them, there's a series of events they're holding. They, I've been to two movie nights they had at the high school. And the one, the first one was, was pretty impactful, but the second one that I think was last week or the week before, they showed a video, I think it was called Just Eat It. I can check, I can email the, the name of it. Um, and it was about a couple in Vancouver who decided that they were not going to buy any food for six months. They were going to survive on what they could get. And I was just horrified at the amount of stuff that is not sold. And I, I think the image that stayed in my head the most, I've always been a keen proponent of PC products and the PC stores. So I usually, I will say, I usually go to Duncan to shop at the superstore. Um, but I was horrified when there was a whole dumpster of PC hummus that was just sitting there somehow that's the vision that stayed in my head but you wouldn't believe the stuff that they found in dumpsters so one thing i do like about and this is not not a adver advertisement for for the Loblots chain but i will say that i'm happy that they um they do packaged food that's imperfect vegetables and fruit that's imperfect so I would just say wherever you are in your grocery store, now I'm more thoughtful about buying those packages that are maybe or things that are marked down because the due date is almost there, because if I don't buy it, it's going to go in the dumpster. So just think about that and think about the fact that if a fruit or a vegetable doesn't look perfect on the outside, it's still going to taste fabulous on the inside. So the amount of food that gets wasted is just mind boggling. So please, you know, I'm more conscious of this now. So please think about it and do your bit. Thanks, Jane. I wasn't going, sorry, I wasn't going to talk um, except for what uh, Jane said. They're following up on that. There's a new, um, app that was listed in the newsletter last week called flash food it's a company that was started a few years ago in toronto about food waste okay and it's partnered up with lob laws it started in toronto and now it's rolling across north america and in town it's partnered up with superstore okay what happens is once food approaches its best before date and it's still good there's still a window of time where it's still edible it's just um by a certain time they have to do it or they'll chuck it as jane said 
once it's approaching its date, the store puts it on sale and it goes on the app and lets you know. So you can get food up to 50% off. Okay. It's been a lot of people are jumping on this bandwagon, you know, especially now that food prices are so high, but it also cuts down on food waste. Okay, it's called flashfood.com. Thank you. You may feel like your leaf is just a tiny flutter in the wind, but it will help strengthen our tree and in turn, our tree will build a forest towards a just, safe world for all. I am often asked, how did you become a Unitarian? We were members of the United Church in Sydney, BC. We had been uncertain of staying on as members and our initial thoughts were that we just didn't fit in. After giving this more thought, we came to the conclusion that it was just wasn't the right fit for us. Not that we didn't fit in. Shortly after this, the minister stepped down. We'd been attending services at a couple of other churches to see if we could find that right fit. We attended services at each church every week for one month and then before moving on to another church. One afternoon in early May, we were sitting on the side on a sidewalk patio of a cafe when our previous minister happened by and we told her about our spiritual journey that we were on. She told us that if she was to make a change, she would consider the Unitarian Church. So on Mother's Day, we attended a service at the First Unitarian Church of Victoria. Let's just say we found our fit. Fast forward to December 2019, we have now moved to Nanaimo to be closer to our grandchildren. We attended several services here at the fellowship and a spaghetti night, uh, and that, which was absolutely wonderful. Uh, then the cursed pandemic. We had not been able to become members here due to that. However, we were grateful to the team here that went out and invested in some excellent equipment so that we could still have services online. We missed the personal touches but we're so grateful that we had this. In the fall of 2021, Sharon was diagnosed with breast cancer, underwent two surgeries, and then a month of radiation last February. Who was there for her? Reverend Deborah and the team of volunteers who would call and check in. She and Deborah would get together and go on walks. And once again, we were so grateful that the fellowship was here for us. Keep in mind, we still weren't members here. We were friends though, and had been contributing financially shortly before, uh, since before the pandemic struck. Seeing the investment in the electronic equipment and other areas, we want to continue to contribute financially to the fellowship. We are so grateful for all that we have received, both emotionally and spiritually. We have recently heard about the new hires, including someone for our children. These are investments in the future of our fellowship and I'm happy to continue to contribute financially so that we can see our fellowship grow. I'm reminded of the Elton Trueblood's quote in her 1951 book, The Life We Prize. A man has made a, at least a start on discovering the meaning of human life when he plants shade trees under which he knows full well he will never sit. Now that we're both online and in the hall, we welcome your donations and pledges in three different ways. First, we have set up the Unitarian Fellowship Bank account to automatically deposit e-transfers sent to info at ufon.ca. Second, you can write a check and pop it in the mail. Third, for those in the hall, there's a basket right at the back of the room here where Bev is sitting and uh, <clears throat> where you can place your donation after the service. Our charity for the month, month is Surf Rider Foundation, Vancouver Island. It's a grassroots nonprofit coastal protection organization with a mission that is dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of our oceans, waves, and beaches. For all people, through a powerful activist network, SFVI has been operating in Victoria, British Columbia since its establishment in 2006. If you would like to uh, donate to the designated charity for the month, Surfrider Foundation, please note that on your e-transfer or check. We're grateful for your offering. If there is to be peace in the world, 
there, there must be peace. peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace in the neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. So may it be. We're nearing the end of our service. After we sing Carry the Flame, you'll have the opportunity to join a social group. There are breakout rooms available online for the next 30 minutes. In the hall, we'll be setting up for snacks and social time and invite any newcomers to stay and join us. I want to thank everyone today for your participation. When breaking things down, as Lee's mentioned, we want to keep this area clear for the uh, people coming in with their equipment. Yeah, well, it's, it's the flame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We invite you to stand as you're able and join us in a large circle around the room holding hands or touching elbows to sing our closing song. Carry the flame. The words are on the back wall and in the front corner. <laughs> 